G'day and welcome to the final concept um, for um, integration chapter seven. Um, for this one, it, this one sort of stands uh, a little bit alone from the rest of them. The rest of them have been dealing with areas and how to work out, calculate our integration, that sort of thing. This one is actually looking at sketching antiderivative graphs. So you, you've got the derivative function and you want to sketch what the original function might look like. In the past, we've done the opposite. We've had the original function and we wanted to sketch the derivative. And now we're just going to make things more confusing by doing the reverse. So um, my, my encouragement would be to go back and look at the uh, the, the diff graph um, uh, exercises that we did, which I think was in chapter 6.4, if I can remember rightly. Um, so you know, almost to have them side by side to kind of you know realize what we're doing. We're actually going from one to the other and then um, back again. So uh, again, I've got some general key uh, principles to, to kind of allow you, allow to help you get to draw these graphs. I would encourage you to write these down or, or to have them somewhere when you're doing these types of questions to just give you an idea of what you should do um, or what you should look for. So I guess the first thing that you um, need to be aware of, or the, the zero thing, if you like, is that we when we anti uh, when we do the antiderivative of, of a, a function, we actually increase the f the power of the function by one. Okay, this is for polynomials, and that's probably what we'll be looking at anyway. Um, so an x cubed graph will become an x to the power of four graph, an x squared graph becomes an x to the power of three graph. Okay. Um, the other thing is on your diff graph, if you have x intercepts um, on the function. Then on your anti-div graph, they will be the stationary points, okay? Because that's where the gradient was zero, and I guess that's what's happening um, when we, you know the, the stationary points become x-intercepts when we're doing the reverse, when we're going from a diff for original to a diff. So when we're going backwards, we're actually the x-intercepts will actually become stationary points of our um, original function or anti-div function. When the uh, a differentiated function or when the, the graph function that we've got is greater than zero that means that the gradient of the anti-diff or the original function is positive I hope this is making some sense I'll, I'll, I'll ground it down with some examples in a second when the um, the uh, graph function that we've got that when the diff graph function is less than zero below the x-axis then that means that the gradient of the anti-diff is negative as well Okay, and then finally, if you have a stationary point on your diff uh, graph, that the graph that you've got, um, it they that just means that they're the steepest parts of the anti-diff graph. The fourth one we don't really worry about too much. It's more important that we look at the other ones. Okay, so that's just a whole bunch of theory. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. But let's have a look at let's ground it in in some actual questions. Okay, so over here on the left hand side, I've got. Um, x squared minus 3x and that's what it looks like and on the right hand side I've got what um, the, the anti-diff graph would look like. So I can see here that the two stationary points, so the, the two x-intercepts when x is 0 and x is 3 those are going to be when the stationary points are on my anti-diff graph and you can see that here. I don't know whether they're going to be maximum or, some, or minimums yet but I can see that they're going to be two stationary points at 0 and at 3. Between 0 and 3, it's negative. Therefore, I know that the gradient of my original function is going to be negative between 0 and 3. And it's going to reach its maximum 0 point, if that makes sense, or minimum 0 point, who knows. It's going to be reach its steepest point at this point in here, somewhere in the middle. So therefore, I know that it's always going down between those two points there. I know that the gradient is positive between when x is less than 0 because it's above the x-axis. Okay, So therefore, this graph here, this blue graph is positive um, and it's getting closer and closer to being zero so therefore it's approaching that point in there. And finally when x is greater than three um, I can see that it's also a positive gradient. It's got nothing to do with the shape of this graph, it's just got to do with whether this value is above the x-axis or whether it's below the x-axis. It's above so therefore it's positive so therefore this one is positive as well. Okay, Let me uh, show you another couple of examples just to try and help you along a little bit more. If I look at a sine graph, um, this is my original function and over on the right hand side is my anti-diff function, or at least the blue one is anyway. So I, again I look at my x-intercepts, they are the stationary points on the new graph. I don't know whether they're maximums, minimums or the points of inflection, I just know that they are the stationary points. So what I would usually do is I would put a dotted line, and I might use black here, I'd put a dotted line there, a dotted line here, and a dotted line here to signify there's stationary points at those three things. I don't know where they are, they could be anywhere, but they are, I know that they're there. 
So um, in the end, it's going to be there, there, and there. But that's because I know a few other things. I know that between um, 0 and pi, I know that the gradient of the original graph, this one over here, is going to be positive. So therefore, I can increase from, I can go from uh, low down here to high up here. Okay, because it's going to be a positive gradient between those two. And similarly here, it's going to be a negative gradient between a pi and 2 pi because it's below the x-axis. Okay, it doesn't matter what the, the gradient of this graph is, it just matters what this is signifying. And over here, that's, oh, this is dy dx, if you like. So the gradient is negative between, zero, is between pi and 2 pi. So that means it goes from above, below, down here. Okay, and coincidentally, it just looks like a negative cos graph anyway. Okay, um, I think I might do one more example, um, and then I'll, I'll, the next video will just cover one little tricky thing that um, I need to tell you about. So this this time I actually don't know what the function is, but I know that there's three parts to the function. Okay, and, and again, this is dy dx, if you like. Okay. So I know that this part here is a constant gradient. It's constant positive gradient. So therefore, over on the right-hand side, it's going to be a constantly going up, going up and across at the same rate, and it's going to be positive. I don't know where. I have no idea how much positive it is, like, but I do know that it's going to be increasing like this. Okay. For this example down here, the next part, um, it's a negative. Uh, sorry, it's a positive gradient from there to there, a zero gradient there, and then a negative gradient down here because this is mapping the gradients. Okay, so I know that this graph here will have a stationary point at that point there. So over here, a dotted line there somewhere, there's going to be a stationary point. Okay, it's going to be a positive gradient before that and a negative gradient after that. Now, it was a straight line, so I'm going to assume that that's um, now a, a quadratic function here uh, with a maximum there. And um, I don't know where these minimums are. I'm just going to put them there and there. It doesn't really matter. As long as you've got it on the same x line, that's fine. And then finally, I've got a function. I don't know what that is, but I can see that it um, has a, an, a stationary point at there. So therefore, somewhere along the line there, it needs to have a stationary point. And I know that it's a, a positive gradient all the way along here. It's getting closer and closer to zero. And then it's a negative gradient um, below here. So I can say that it looks something like this. It might not look exactly like this, but this is good enough. It's signifying that it's positive. It reaches a stationary point and then it becomes negative. And I don't know if it goes below the x-axis. It will eventually, but I don't know when. Um, it doesn't really matter too much about that. The key important points are that you, you've got the, the stationary points locked in and you've got whether it's above, it's a positive gradient or a negative gradient. The only other last thing I'll say is that the um, open circles, for diff graphs, they're always open circles, so therefore anti-diff graphs should also be um, open circles as well. It's very rare that you would find a, a closed circle um, on either one of these graphs. Okay, so hopefully that's helped you. My encouragement would be to go back up to the rules that I've got up here and write those down somewhere um, and have them when you're doing these graphs. And sometimes I actually find doing diff graphs and anti-diff graphs, you know, kind of side by side, it actually helps you a little bit because you, you start to go, hang on, which one am I doing? Am I increasing the function or am I decreasing the function? Um, sometimes doing these side by side can actually be helpful. So. Thanks for watching the series on integration um, for Chapter 7. There's a couple more videos that um, they, they sort of fit into to Chapter 7, but they're not quite in the textbook. Um, so I will go through them anyway because we do need to cover these um, before probably um, the, the um, integration sack and, and definitely before the exam. Um, so I'll make the videos and, and I guess you can just watch them, although there's not a, a truckload of questions in the textbook, but I do have some questions um, that I can give you at another time. So um, thanks for watching this one and I'll, I'll see you in the next one.